Good morning, one and all. Today we'll be talking about uh, the TMJ and its uh, disorders. And uh, we'll be talking a little about uh, uh, TMJ development, uh, its uh, anatomical structure and how it's important, how, how it's unique uh, to a human body and the various disorders uh, affecting the TMJ uh, complex as such and also the radiography part which will uh, uh, which provides an adjunct to uh, dental physicians to come up with a specific diagnosis and uh, hence its treatment <coughs> as we all know uh, the joints in the human body are uh, classified as basically three types uh, primarily the fibrous or the cartilaginous or the synovial uh, types of joints among which your TMJ comes up uh, under the uh, subheading of synovial joints wherein you can see uh, it is further divided into uniaxial, biaxial or uh, uh, triaxial depending upon the axis upon which uh, the jaws open or uh, the uh, um, this movement between the joints uh, in uh, de depending upon the w which type of axis it opens up and also uh, in uh, which planes it open up and how it opens up these synovial joints are further divided into uh, two uh, subclassifications among which you can see uh, the planar or the gingivoid. Uh, gingivoid uh, also means a hinging type or a planar or a hinging type of movement which is uh, a part uh, of a description of the TMJ joint. Hence in uh, human beings TMJ is described as a synovial uh, sliding uh, gingivoid joint. Uh, this is a unique uh, joint which is not seen in any other kind of uh, joint within the human body primarily because it has both the sliding capabilities as well as the hinging capabilities of the in this joint so it is a combination of two types of movements hence it is called as a synovial sliding gingivoid joint now if you move over to the development of tmj uh, the uh, initial uh, development starts with the meckel's cartilage as you all know it is a starting point for the initial or the primary jaw this meckel's cartilage by a process of ossification uh, develops into the primary jaw which uh, terminates as the malleus or the incus which we know as uh, as the ear joints which is the primary TMJ joint and it exists for some time. Now in after this primary uh, joint uh, uh, takes place or development is finished then uh, there is a secondary jo uh, joint which starts uh, 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 developing. Now how this uh, secondary uh, joint develops? Initially, there is a mesenchymal condensation between the uh, temp in the temporal region as well as in, uh, in the condylar region. As you can see in this, as I was saying, uh, the development consists of two basic parts: the primary uh, jaw development as the secondary jaw development. In the primary jaw development, what happens is it starts uh, as an ossification around the meckel's cartilage, and it terminates as the malleus, and it uh, joins up with the incus. So the joint between the malleus and the incus is the primary jaw uh, development or the primary uh, TMJ which exists for some time and after this the secondary jaw development starts which takes place in uh, two uh, kinds of mesenchymal uh, condensations. The mesenchymal condensations can be are, uh, found in the temporal region as well as in the uh, condyle uh, region. As you can see in this uh, diagram you can see the uh, condensations in the primary uh, neonatal uh, head wherein the mesenchymal condensations both in the condylar region and in the, uh, and in the temporal region. Now this condens condensation in a later uh, uh, developmental stages, there is a slight split which uh, occurs at the, uh, at the superior surface of the uh, condyla and the inferior surface of the temporal region and this slits further uh, develops into the upper joint cavity and in the lower joint cavity as is evident in the diagram. Now the anatomy of uh, TMJ uh, after the uh, total development as you can see it's, it consists of the mandibular fossa within which the condyla rests. There is a superior joint uh, cavity which we have seen as the cleft which forms in the temporal uh, uh, blastometer or the temporal uh, mesenchymal condensation. The inferior joint cavity which is nothing but the further uh, uh, modification of the cleft which, produce, which is uh, seen in the condylar uh, blastometer or the condylar mesenchymal condensation. And the mandibular condyle which is the inferior uh, joint uh, portion, the arti articular tubercle, the articular capsule which encloses this TMJ complex as well as the ramus of the mandible. Now if you see the uh, TMJ from the anterior portion or the superior uh, view or uh, anterior view of the TMJ, we can see how it is enclosed within uh, the various ligaments, the medial ligament, the lateral ligament, the capsular ligament 
and how it is uh, held together by these uh, ligaments and the various musculatures which are primarily responsible for the various uh, disorders which uh, uh, come up in the TMJ complex. Now if you go into the TMJ disorders as such, now according to the uh, classification given by uh, most accepted classification of TMJ disorders, it's dependent upon the clinical location of this disorder, depending upon which part of the TMJ complex is affected. The TMD disorders are uh, classified according to that. Now, if you can see, the we know the there's, there are various muscles which hold up this TMJ complex in its place. Now, as we know, the TMJ uh, disorders, the various TMD uh, disorders are uh, classified depending upon the location upon which we can uh, identify these disorders in the TMJ complex. Now this TMJ complex is basically made of the bone tissue, the muscle tissue as well as the disc which is the soft tissue. Now the muscles uh, if affected are uh, the most common disorders uh, seen within the muscles of the myofascial pain and myofascial pain with limited opening. The disc if it is affected we have uh, three types of disc displacements which are uh, most commonly seen. One is with reduction and without reduction and within the without reduction we have limited opening as well as no limited opening. Now, the third component is the bone, the articular bone, if it is affected, the most common disorders seen over here is osteoarthritis as well as osteoarthrosis of TMJ. Now, according to the uh, AOP, uh, American Association of Oral uh, Orofacial Pain, they defined TMD as a collective uh, uh, term which uh, encloses the various clinical problems which affects either of uh, either of the uh, either the mus uh, masculatory musculature or the temporomandible joint or both of them in association with some other components uh, involved in the TMJ complex. Now the, what are the risk factors of TMJ? Uh, the various number of uh, there is a rainbow of uh, etiological factors which uh, can cause a TMJ on a short run or a long run. The primarily among them is trauma either it, it might be a mini trauma or a major trauma which in a course of time can develop into a TMD. Now this trauma uh, can be uh, because of uh, normal extractions or uh, whiplash injuries or uh, road traffic accidents, any kind of trauma which involves the TMJ complex. Also the uh, intraoral uh, factors such as uh, uh, parafunctional habits or uh, the malocclusion, any of these which causes a disturbance in the natural uh, orientation of the TMJ will cause uh, a TMJ in the longer run. Now, uh, apart from that, we also have the lifestyle uh, problems, uh, the stressful life of emotional factors, which brings about biochemical changes within the articular surface of the uh, TM, uh, TMJ complex, thereby progressing into uh, uh, further uh, serious uh, problems involving the bones such as osteoarthritis or osteoarthrosis of the TMJ. Now, among this uh, TMD disorders, the most common type of uh, disorder which affects a majority of the population is called MPDS, also called as myofascial pain dysfunction syndrome. Now, among this, it is ba it basically affects the muscles which hold the TMJ in place. Now, uh, we all know the various muscles, the lateral pterygoid, the medial pterygoid, the temporalis, the masseter, all these uh, muscles hold this particular TMJ complex in its functional state and its anatomical state. Now any one or more of these muscles if affected by the various etiological factors will lead into TMJ, will lead to this uh, specific kind of uh, uh, disorder that is known as MPDS. Now among this as you know since the muscles are involved the main clinical signs and symptoms are uh, pertaining to the muscles which hold the TMJ in uh, place such as the tenderness of the muscle or pain or the referred pain or the uh, pain uh, extending referring uh, to other parts of the uh, uh, orofacial structures originating basically from the muscles. <coughs> uh, this is uh, basically a chronic kind of uh, uh, a disorder basically TMD itself is a chronic kind of a disease wherein uh, step by step these etiological factors they amount up the pile up and then result in this kind of uh, uh, disorder. Now, uh, uh, as, I, as I told, uh, apart from the various etiological factors which uh, 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 affect uh, the particular personality to develop uh, uh, MPDS, uh, among them the most common are the malocclusion or the arthritis which affects the TMJ joint which further uh, uh, results in disorientation of the uh, musculatures 
which hold the TMJ in place. So basically, MPDS is a psychological uh, uh, kind of a disease wherein psychological uh, uh, education of the patient is needed to overcome this problem. Now, uh, be it the uh, posture or the para functions, habits or the stress management, whatever it is, it's basically lies, it basically lies in uh, making the patient aware of what kind of disease he is undergoing and what is the problem, uh, which, uh, uh, what are the etiological factors due to which he is uh, experiencing this problem. Starting with posture, the, any uh, kind of habits or any kind of uh, indulgences which uh, disturb the normal anatomical uh, uh, position of the TMJ or which uh, forces the TMJ complex to be uh, in an abnormal position rather than its normal position for a prolonged uh, uh, period of time. That results in MPDS. Now, uh, we know the MPDS affects the various musculatures uh, of the uh, TMJ complex, among which we know the main uh, muscles of mastication, uh, such as the lateral pterygoid, medial pterygoid, temporalis, the masseter and uh, more uh, rarely uh, the diagnostics or the muscles of the cervical spine. Now if we uh, deal with each and uh, uh, every muscle which actually uh, uh, plays an important role in uh, progression of the person into MPDS, the most important muscle which we encountered is the lateral pterygoid. Now if you see in this uh, picture the origin of the lateral pterygoid starts from the lateral pterygoid plate of the sphenoid. Start, uh, starting from there it extends into the condyle and neck and the ramus of the mandible and the disc. Now, since its insertion is uh, both into the condyle and neck as well as the disc, it plays an important role, the uh, primary role or a dominant role in, uh, uh, in this MPDS wherein the muscles are affected. Now, uh, as I said, this is the most uh, primary source of uh, uh, pain in uh, MPDS and because of the attachment to the disc, it results in the uh, characteristic clicking or popping sounds, which I'll be talking about in the, in the later slides. The most common cause is an intraoral uh, cause, wherein there is uh, any kind of uh, uh, malocclusion or uh, any kind of parafunctional habits which results in malocclusion or any kind of uh, uh, disturbances in the uh, uh, normal functioning of the TMJ. Involvement of the pa uh, patient in parafunctional habits, wherein parafunctional habits are basically habits which do not have any uh, uh, positive effects on the human uh, oral musculature, but it has an adverse effect. Now, these are the parafunctional habits such as uh, clenching or bruxism. These are the parafunctional habits I'm talking about. Now, the second most important kind of uh, uh, muscle is the next uh, is the medial pterygoid. As you can see in the diagram, it starts from the inner surface of the lateral pterygoid plate of the spinoid and ends and inserts into the uh, ramus of the mandible by the angle. Now, since because of its anatomical location, any uh, uh, problem within this muscle, only this muscle, results apart from the clinical signs and symptoms of MPDS, there is also stuffiness of the ear because of its uh, unique uh, origin and insertion. Now, because of it, uh, you, we all know uh, medial pterygoid is a primary uh, muscle which is responsible for closure of the jaw. Now, whenever this particular muscle is affected, we will have difficulty uh, in the closure of the jaw as well as difficulty in protrusion of the jaw since because of the anterior inclination of this particular uh, muscle as you can see in this diagram. Now the third most important muscle is the temporalis. Uh, it is uh, ever a working uh, kind of a muscle wherein uh, only uh, it rests or the, or the rest position for this particular muscle is only when you are in a supine position. Now, this origin, we can see it starts from the temporal fascia, which is, which is, uh, starts from the uh, temporal fascia, which is superior to the zygomatic arch and inserts into the coronary process of the mandible, which holds the TMJ in, uh, complex in place. Now, because of uh, this particular uh, 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 muscle plays the third most important kind of uh, 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 etiological uh, third most important kind of muscle which affects the uh, TMJ and results in MPTS. Now the other one is a masseter which is a primary closure, kind, uh, closure uh, mus uh, muscle for the TMJ complex. It origins from the zygomatic arch as you can see over here and inserts into the mandibular angle and the ramus. Now because of the inclination uh, downwards and posterior of this uh, muscle fibers, you can see how it helps in primary closure. It is the most important kind of 
muzzle which is responsible in clenching of your teeth or uh, while chew, uh, chewing or talking. Now if you see the referral pattern of this particular uh, muzzle because of its unique uh, position uh, downwards and backwards of this particular muzzle we can see the referral uh, pattern of this pain which arises when only this muzzle is affected goes up to the forehead into the maxilla lower up to uh, lower jaw up to the chin or into the ear so it has a 360 kind uh, degrees kind of uh, effect or the referral pain pattern which is unique to this kind of this muzzle only and which is not seen for uh, in uh, any other muscles uh, affecting uh, uh, the uh, TMJ complex resulting in MPDS. Now, as I told, uh, what are the parafunction habits? Is, uh, these are basically the habits which the patient involves himself, which do not have any positive effects or uh, 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 good effects on the oral musculature. Rather, it has a der uh, derogatory or a deleterious uh, effect onto the oral ma uh, musculature. Now, uh, any kind of, uh, of a function which overuses the TMJ or overstresses the TMJ complex or forces the TMJ complex to be in an abnormal position rather than its normal functional and anatomical position for a long period of time are uh, can be classified under as parafunctional habits. As you know, uh, so it starts from simple uh, gum chewing for a uh, prolonged uh, period of time leading uh, uh, up to clenching or bruxism or biting nails or the posture or phone cradling any kind of uh, habits which forces the TMJ to be in an abnormal position for a prolonged period of time can be classified as parafunctional behaviors. Now uh, this being said about the muscles, muscle component the next most common kind of a disorder which is seen in TMJ complex is those which affect the disc. Now this uh, uh, disc derangement as it is called the disorder is the most common kind of uh, team disorder which is seen and uh, as you know as we, uh, we saw in the previous pictures how the disc is uh, held together by the various kind of ligaments the capsular ligaments the medial ligament and the lateral ligament any disturbance in these particular ligaments or any weakness in the muscles which hold the disc in its place will result uh, in a shift of this particular disc uh, from its normal position leading to classical disc derangement uh, signs and symptoms and hence its problems. Now, before we uh, understand uh, the exact uh, scenario of uh, disc derangement, we need to know the exact uh, the resting joint position and the normal function, normal functional uh, disc position. As we can see over here in the resting joint position how the thinnest part of the articular disc is a place wherein the condyle uh, rests itself and that is a, a primary joint uh, contact between the temporal part, temporal bone as well as the condylar part, the thinnest part of the articular disc and anteriorly it is uh, uh, held by uh, musculature and ligaments and where uh, posteriorly also it is held by musculatures. Now when this particular uh, joint or TMJ complex moves forward, what happens is the condyle along with the thinnest part of the articular disc moves forward up to the tip of the articular disc with, uh, with the extension of the retrodiscal tissue or the posterior ligaments and uh, concomitantly with the anterior uh, ligaments and the anterior musculature and this complex then again goes back via sliding motion as well as uh, rotating motion back to its original position. Now what happens in internal derangement is because of the weakness of uh, retrodiscal tissues or weakness of the lateral pterygoid muscle which comes up anteriorly and holds the disc in its position or over usage of these muscles or uh, uh, ligaments what happens is that the condyle doesn't uh, 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 rest with the thinnest part of the uh, articular disc but instead it goes backward that means to say the, uh, inter uh, the disc moves slightly forward because of this uh, lethargic kind of uh, ligaments and muscles in place and what happens is the condyle no longer rests with the thinnest part but uh, rests with the posterior part of the articular disc. Now this uh, poses a problem when the uh, patient wants to talk or uh, as I was talking about the uh, normal resting uh, joint position and the normal functional movements wherein the condyle uh, head 
uh, rests with the thinnest part of the articular disc and not with the posterior or the anterior part of the articular disc and this is a uh, complex is player seen within the glenoid fossa. Now in the uh, normal joint position as you can see the retrodiscal uh, tissues extends the thinnest part of the articular disc along with the condylar head moves forward first rotates within the glenoid fossa and then translates in a planar motion up to the tip of the uh, articular eminence which you can see over here. Now this being the normal uh, functional motion or the normal uh, joint uh, uh, position. In uh, internal derangement what happens is because of the, uh, uh, because of the uh, weakness or over usage of the uh, posterior ligaments of the retrodiscal tissue or the anteriorly uh, lateral pterygoid muscle uh, musculature this uh, in, uh, articular disc no longer rests in its normal position that means to say it translates forward as you can see over here it translates forward with over extension of the retrodiscal tissue and because of the weakness of the lateral pterygoid muscle or any uh, uh, disorders or disease affecting these musculatures this translates forward and the condylar head no longer rests with the thinnest portion of the articular disc but instead it rests with the posterior part of the articular disc within the glenoid fossa. Now how this uh, causes uh, problems in disc derangement? Now imagine this kind of scenario in a uh, uh, disc derangement patient and when the patient tries to open as you can see the retrodiscal tissue is already overextended from its uh, posterior uh, attachments. Now this condylar movement rotates initially over in the clearinate fossa and then translates forward in a pl uh, planar motion. But since the retrodiscal tissue is already overextended, now it cannot extend beyond a certain point of time. So when the condylar head tries to move forward in a planar motion downwards and forwards, there is, it is held back because of the inelasticity of the retrodiscal tissue since it's already in an extended position. Now what happens is, uh, the resultant being limited opening where the condyle do, uh, does not uh, extend up to the articular eminence because it is being held back by the retrodiscal tissue and that results in limited mouth opening. Now what happens in few cases is, now this what I was talking about is uh, TMA disc derangement with limited opening. Okay. Now in, uh, in, uh, to take the case a little forward, now if this uh, uh, discal tissue is even more loosely held and uh, uh, along with that the other uh, capsular ligaments or the medial or the lateral uh, ligaments also are uh, uh, slightly weak. What happens is this condyle head while in its uh, uh, strive to come forward it overcomes this particular hump which is seen uh, in the articular disc and jumps forward pushing the articular disc backwards. Now uh, what happens is if you see this uh, thin portion over here right now it is at the articular eminence. Now when the patient tries to open his mouth the condylar head moves forward pushes this posterior part of the articular disc backwards and then rests into the thinnest part of the articular uh, disc at uh, the precipice that is the articular eminence. Now this is not it. Now the patient has opened the mouth there is no limited opening but when he tries to close back again. Now this condylar head because of the incapabilities of the uh, posterior ligaments and the anterior ligaments it has to overcome this particular hump and goes back into the uh, glenoid fossa. Now this process of translation of uh, condylar head back into its glenoid fossa over this kind of uh, hump because uh, of the incapabilities of the articular disc it jumps over this hump and goes back into the glenoid fossa. Now this jumping of this condylar head when it goes translates back into its position results in the characteristic clicking or the popping sound which is seen in most of TMD cases as well as disc derangement cases. Now this is the result. Now this uh, scenarios, uh, a combination of these scenarios results in disc derangement with limited opening or without limited opening or with uh, clicking or popping sounds or without clicking or popping sounds. So this particular derangement uh, uh, results in the various kind of uh, uh, classifications of a disc derangement which we see with limited opening or without limited opening or with the clicking or uh, popping sounds and in few cases no uh, such, uh, such kind of sounds.
Now, as I was saying, uh, apart from the clinical examination or the history taking, uh, imaging of the TMJ or the various modalities which are used to uh, uh, image the hard tissue or the soft tissue uh, plays an important adjunctive role in uh, pinpointing the exact diagnosis and also helps us in managing this particular case, uh, this particular uh, disease. Now, within the imaging of uh, TMJ, we know uh, depending upon the heart, uh, whether we want to uh, image the heart tissue primarily the temporal part and the condylar head or the neck of the condyle or the soft tissue uh, imaging which uh, primarily deals with the disc it can be classified as heart tissue imaging and soft tissue imaging now within heart tissue imaging the pri uh, the most important or the primary kind of uh, uh, radiograph which we take is a panoramic uh, projection then moving on to a few uh, specialized uh, extra oral uh, uh, kind of projections uh, that is the transcranial or the transpharyngeal or the transorbital kind of uh, projections then moving over to uh, a little more, uh, the next step in uh, extra oral imaging that is your SMV view, uh, submental vertex uh, projection. And then apart from this uh, conventional type of radiographs, then we move on to uh, the more recent kind of uh, uh, radiographs which are taken a little more on the expensive uh, side. That is the conventional tomography or the computed tomography, which provides us 3D images of the same uh, uh, 2D projections. Now, apart from that, uh, uh, we have soft tissue imaging, primarily uh, the most uh, common kind of uh, soft tissue imaging at chair side is the arthrography and then followed by MRA, which uh, in its sense produces uh, 3D images of the same uh, 2D uh, images which, we are, which are taken. <coughs> now, if we move on to the panoramic uh, projection, as I said, this is the most, uh, this is the primary or the first kind of uh, imaging uh, modality which we use to uh, determine any kind of uh, problems in the TMJ complex and it basically serves as a screening projection primarily because of the huge amount of uh, uh, blurring or huge amount of superimposition of the other uh, 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 parts of the middle cranial fossa or the anterior cranial fossa over this uh, TMJ complex. It is basically used as a screening projection and only major changes, uh, major physical uh, changes or bony changes can be seen in the panoramic projection such as your uh, if there is major asymmetries or osteophytes or uh, fractures or any odontological uh, odontogenic causes which results in TM day only gross changes can be made out uh, by uh, by panoramic imaging primarily because of its uh, lack of clarity and superimposition as you can see there is a standard uh, uh, digital uh, panoramic uh, imaging which is taken in four parts that is uh, two uh, relating to the uh, left uh, condyle and two relating to the right condyle and each of the uh, uh, image uh, one in the resting position and one in the open position as you can see over here this is the resting position of the condyle we can see the condylar head over here and the articular eminence and the temporal part and this is the open opening uh, open state of the TMJ wherein the condyle has translated up to the articular eminence Similarly, on the right hand side, we have similar pictures. Now, we can see the huge amount of superimposition of the middle cranial uh, structures, middle cranial fossa structures, as well as the other uh, bony uh, uh, parts within this uh, area. Now, because of this, only major uh, changes can be seen. Nevertheless, panoramic uh, projection provides as a screen projection or an initial shot or a scout imaging before we go in for any advanced uh, imaging modalities. Now, as I said, uh, the disadvantages, uh, primarily we do not uh, have any information about the condylar position or the function. Uh, since this is not a functional uh, type of imaging, this is just a positional kind of uh, imaging. And also because of the superimposition of the skull uh, base and the zygomatic arch, we have uh, minor changes are uh, not uh, uh, evident in this kind of uh, uh, imaging only mark changes can be seen. Now this is a screenshot for uh, the control panel for the digital panoramic imaging and the subsequent pictures. Now can, you can see the uh, left hand side we have the condyla in its resting position within the glenoid fossa. Now we can see the same condyle in the open position at the summit of the articular eminence. Now the first uh, kind of uh, extra oral imaging which we uh, do after the screening uh, uh, projection of pa uh, screening or panoramic projection is the transcranial or the Lindblom uh, projection. Now if you see the uh, 
picture of the uh, projection of this kind of uh, imaging we, it uh, provides a certain clues as to which kind of uh, which areas of the tmj is evident in this image what kind of uh, uh, structures can be clearly seen on this image and which uh, which structures if affected can be uh, seen on this image if you see the patient is uh, uh, aligned perpendicular to the uh, central ray that is to say the mid sagittal line mid sagittal plane which passes over uh, in this uh, direction that is parallel to the cassette which is placed so the mid sagittal plane of the patient is parallel to the cassette and it is perpendicular to the central ray now if you see the downward angulation primarily because of the v shaped structure of the tmj now if we have to uh, get the sagittal picture or the perpendicular picture of the tmj condyla head and the neck we need to slightly uh, uh, give a downward tilt to this uh, uh, x ray machine so that the central ray passes through the sagittal plane of the uh, condyla head and provides a superior view of the same uh, condyla head and the temporal part as well as the articular space we see the 20 the 25 degrees uh, downward tilt a positive uh, angulation and also it is placed slightly behind the patient moving forward so there is a, a tilt of again 20 degrees in the anterior posterior direction so as to again compensate for the v shaped structure of the tmj now this v shaped structure uh, enables uh, this uh, central rate uh, to pass exactly at a perpendicular uh, 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 a perpendicular 90 degrees but it, this 20 degree uh, uh, angulation which is given in the anterior posterior direction compensates for the v-shaped uh, angulation of the tmj now because because of this uh, unique positioning of a transcranial projection uh, we know that the sagittal view or the lateral aspects of the condylar head as well as the superior view is seen over here so what are the uses of this transcranial uh, projection we can see any gross changes in the superior lateral aspect primarily because of its uh, position the lateral position and the superior position we can also see the uh, any displaced uh, condylar fractures to study the articular eminence or this, uh, study the joint space since the positioning of the central ray in this uh, projection is superior now uh, over the years uh, this uh, transcranial projection uh, the central ray the placement of the central ray has been quite uh, debated about now uh, few authors uh, few of them suggest that there are three kinds of uh, projections wherein the central rays can pass through extra uh, from uh, from the outside depending upon the open mouth position or the rest position or the closed position now depending upon which kind of position we use uh, different authors uh, suggest different kind of point of entries and uh, they are, uh, according to that uh, they have come up with three techniques the post auricular or the Lindblom technique which is the most common kind of technique used for this uh, projection the Grucock technique and the Gills technique now it is very simple over here starting with the uh, post auricular since the name uh, your name suggests it is behind the auricle the post to the auricle so it is the point of entry is half inch behind the external auditory meters and two inches above the external auditory meters now if you move on to the grucock uh, technique it moves forward it is directly two inches above the external auditory meters now if we go to the gills technique it is half inch uh, before in front of the external artery meters and two inches above the external artery these are the uh, radiographs the resultant images we can see uh, the condyle in this transcranial projection in the closed position when the condyla condyla head rests within the glenoid fossa and how it uh, translates forward in the open position the same uh, uh, transcranial projection we can see uh, the landmark over here that is your external artery meters and the adjacent structures now the next uh, uh, so moving on to the next uh, extra projection that is a transpharyngeal uh, projection uh, also known as a uh, McQueen's or Palmer or infracranial projection now uh, as the name suggests it is transpharyngeal so across the pharynx the projection takes place now because it involves uh, soft tissues uh, in relation to the 
previous uh, projection which I've talked about that is a transcranial uh, uh, kind of projection because it involves a lot of air spaces and soft tissues the exposure uh, parameters or the exposure time for this particular uh, projection is drastically lower when compared to uh, transcranial uh, uh, projections now uh, similar to transcranial uh, it also provides a sagittal view uh, of the condyle the only difference uh, being over here it provides a sagittal view of the medial pole of the condyle that is to say the condylar head, uh, if you see from the uh, medial lateral, uh, if you see the uh, 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 cross section of the condyle, we can see the medial pole and the lateral pole. And this medial pole uh, is uh, anatomically uh, very important. So, this particular projection views the sagittal uh, viewing, sagittal uh, view of the medial pole of this condyle. Now, uh, since it uh, provides a medial aspect and the if you look into the uh, projection of this uh, central ray in this particular projection, uh, in this particular radiograph, we see it is a is it is given a negative angulation. So in so as to say, the central rays pass from downward above. So uh, hence its name as infracranial uh, projection. Uh, its usage it is effective uh, for uh, visualizing any kind of erosions in uh, arthritis, or osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis or osteoarthrosis. Uh, and similar to panoramic imaging, because of a uh, huge amount of superimposition of the other, other uh, infracranial uh, bones, uh, it is uh, basically uh, used to uh, visualize any marked changes rather than any subtle changes. Now, uh, if you see the uh, projection, we can see how uh, it is directed superiorly at a negative angulation of minus 5 degrees and it is uh, 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 position through the sigmoid notch on the opposite side at 7 to 8 degrees anterior, posteriorly from the anterior. That is to say, if you see the V-shaped structure of the TMJ and the position of the condylar head, how it is positioned medial laterally, we can see if we have to view the medial pole of the TMJ, you have to give a slight uh, uh, angulation to the central ray anteriorly. That is uh, that is what is uh, achieved by giving this uh, plus 7 to 8 degrees uh, angulation. Now, the position of the central ray uh, is uh, important in this uh, uh, projection, wherein the patient opens his mouth and after opening his mouth, the central ray is uh, beamed through the sigmoid notch. Now, this sigmoid notch is nothing but a small gap or a space which is uh, formed uh, when the uh, uh, between the condyle the coronary process and the zygomatic arch in an open position. Now, this is a, a classic uh, transpharyngeal view in the open position. You can see the condylar head up to the uh, translating up to the articular eminence, and we can also see the uh, glenoid fossa and the temporal part of the uh, TMJ uh, complex. Now the third type is transorbital. Name suggests it is transorbital, so it is across the orbits. So the viewing of this particular uh, uh, radiograph is anterior posteriorly. So when you view the uh, radiograph from anterior uh, anterior uh, aspect, we can see the entire medial lateral dimensions of the condylar head. So any uh, changes or uh, any uh, displacements in the medial lateral direction or any fractures. Uh, of the condylar head or the condylar neck can be easily seen in this transorbital projection. As I said, the most important uh, function of uh, uh, this uh, uh, projection is to uh, view any displacements of condylar head as well as the fractures of the head and the neck of the condyle. Now, this is also an open mouth uh, projection. So, uh, uh, it entirely depends upon the patient how uh, efficiently can he move the condyle up to the uh, articular eminence. Now, why I am saying uh, he has to uh, move the condyle up to the articular eminence is to prevent any superimposition of this articular eminence over the condylar head. Now, only when the condyle moves up to the eminence or the uh, uh, precipice of the articular eminence, we can see a, a differentiate a small amount of gap between the articular eminence and the condyle head and any fractures involving the superior surface of the condylar head can be easily made out. Now, if the condylar head does not move up to the uh, articular eminence, a little amount of this bony uh, uh, portion of articular eminence overlaps over the uh, condylar head, thereby obscuring any information related to the superior surface of the condylar head. Now, if we see the uh, picture over here, 
we can see the angulations the how the uh, patient is in uh, open uh, jaw position that it is the central ray is passed through the inner canthus of the uh, of the same eye or the uh, contralateral eye and uh, the central ray passes through the condyle and how the uh, slight tilt in the horizontal plane of 30 degrees is given and the uh, cassette is placed behind the patient so so as to give a and uh, total anterior view and to view the total medial lateral dimensions of the condylar head this is a classical picture how you can see the condylar head has translated up to the precipice of the articular eminence we can clearly make out the joint cavity over here and how there is no superimposition of the articular eminence other uh, uh, temporal structures now the other kind of uh, external view that is a, a submental vertex uh, view sm view or the basal projection which gives a total basal uh, view or the inferior view of the total uh, uh, condylar uh, arches uh, condylar heads the arches and the uh, its a glenar fossa and the temporal part now uh, if we look at the picture of uh, submental vertex we can easily know the uh, patient positioning as well as the usage of this particular radiograph now you can see how the patient is positioned is patient is positioned uh, supine with the head totally tilted back so the <coughs> so uh, his mid sagittal plane is uh, perpendicular to the ca cassette which is placed at the vertex the positioning of the central ray is below the uh, mandibles from uh, below if you draw a line between the condyles an imaginary line between the condyles uh, joining the right and left condyle 2 cm ahead of this uh, 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 of this line towards the chin is just a position extra extra relief from which the central ray passes through now that uh, gives a total basal view of the total uh, structures and we can see how any facial asymmetries or uh, uh, displacements of the condylar heads in the medial lateral direction can be easily seen so any uh, gross changes on the right and left hemispheres can be easily uh, made out in this particular uh, projection now uh, apart from that we can uh, uh, also determine the angulations of the long axis of the condyle which is uh, important for uh, uh, taking the patient into computed tomography when the first uh, long axis of the condyles have to be uh, determined and that can be determined only by using smv now that uh, being the hard tissue imaging the soft tissue imaging is uh, relatively uh, simple uh, the most common uh, kind of uh, and the conventional kind of imaging which is used to image the disc uh, be it the morphology or be it the function or be it the position of the articular disc the most common uh, one uh, used is arthrography now uh, <coughs> basically uh, soft tissue imaging is used when heart tissue imaging uh, do not provide us any clues as to the uh, explanation of the clinical signs or symptoms or wherein uh, wherein uh, the conventional type of treatment modalities which are given to treat uh, tmj disorders uh, do not work out uh, in the patient because and then the patient is taken into a, then the patient might be suspected of having some soft tissue uh, disorders uh, pertaining to the disc and then uh, soft tissue imaging is taken up now uh, arthrography is basically an uh, indirect imaging of the soft tissue it's not basically uh, you're not trying to uh, image the soft tissue uh, on its own but you're trying to exclude out the uh, hard tissues or the bony tissues around it and then view the articular disc indirectly so what happens is in this an iodine based contrast medium is uh, given what happens is this contrast medium is uh, uh, with the help of uh, heart tissue imaging which is a, a mandatory pre procedure for arthrography this uh, iodine based contrast uh, uh, medium is uh, injected uh, into the superior joint space as well as the inferior joint space now after this uh, uh, joint spaces are uh, filled up with this contrast medium then uh, uh, conventional radiographs are taken and this contrast medium shows up as a radio opaque image and what remains behind is a dark radio lucent image of the uh, articular disc now disc if there are any perforations or if there are any uh, malformations or uh, or disorientations from its normal position this articular disc takes the shape as in uh, uh, in the uh, 
uh, as the contrast medium uh, shows up in the uh, radiographs and then uh, subsequent uh, inferences are derived from. Now uh, we can see in this picture uh, there is a condylar head, the temporal part, uh, temporal bone. We can see the upper joint space as well as the lower joint space which is filled up with this iodine uh, based contrast medium which shows up as a radio opaque image and then we can see the radiolucent indirect image of the articular disc. We can see both uh, in this is a disc derangement wherein there is an enlarged posterior part. Now uh, indications as I said long standing TMJ disorders which haven't been uh, uh, responsive, to, uh, responsive to the normal uh, uh, treatment modalities uh, for uh, TMJ disorders or a persistent history of locking wherein uh, the, patient, uh, the physician may suspect a soft tissue or a disc uh, derangement instead of a heart, heart tissue abnormality. And uh, the contraindications obviously in uh, acute inf infections of the joint. We cannot uh, use this iodine based uh, uh, contrast medium because it further aggravates the situation. And obviously since the main cons constraint of this contrast medium and uh, of course since uh, the main uh, constraint of uh, this uh, contrast medium is iodine. Uh, so any allergic uh, conditions towards this iodine or the contrast medium it is contraindicated. Now in those conditions we uh, uh, go in for MRI imaging. Uh, MRI imaging is basically a usage of magnetic field and radio frequency impulses, magnetic resonance imaging to image this uh, TMJ complex in a 3D structures. The primary usage of this is without moving the uh, patient both the sagittal as well as the coronal pictures are taken uh, at the same time. And a 3D construction is given of the so of all the soft tissues uh, within the TMJ complex, be it the muscles or the ligaments or the articular disc itself. And then uh, uh, subsequent inferences are taken from. Now, uh, what uh, we have to remember over here is there are different modalities in uh, MRI imaging. There's T1 weighted uh, modality, a proton weighted uh, modality, a T2 weighted uh, uh, modality. All these are different pulse sequences upon which a MRI image can be taken. Now the standard uh, uh, procedures what we uh, follow is whenever there are any bone changes or any discal changes we have to go for T1 weighted images or proton weighted images. Apart from that if there are any inflammatory changes uh, or joint effusions or perforations in the articular disc then we go for T2 weighted images. Now uh, this MRI is the uh, most the latest uh, uh, soft tissue imaging modality wherein uh, any contraindications to the conventional type of uh, uh, soft tissue imaging uh, you can uh, the uh, physician can always opt for the MRI imaging. Now you can see how clear pictures of the sagittal as well as the coronal sections of the uh, this particular patient has been taken. This, this is in fact a normal TMJ where again you see the a clear outline of the condyle, temporal uh, bone and the articular disc and the coronal structures. All this taken uh, at the same time without moving the patient. Now what are the take home points? As you can see what the uh, this TMJ complex is such a, uh, a complex entity, a unique kind of joint wherein so many uh, uh, portions or uh, musculatures or ligaments, the heart tissue or the soft tissue play an important role in the normal functioning of the TMJ. So apart from the signs and symptoms, the clinical, the typical signs and symptoms which the physician uh, faces, he has to also use uh, as a joint mission or uh, the radiological modalities, the imaging modalities to uh, uh, pinpoint the exact problem, come up with a specific diagnosis and then treat the uh, patient accordingly. Now even uh, in imaging we as we can see uh, as we have seen depending whether it is a heart tissue or a soft tissue or depending upon which portion of the TMJ complex or TMJ complex has to be viewed the right kind of imaging has to be used over here. Thank you.